Foundations for Reconstruction. This is part 10, the commandment about stealing. We've been looking at these, taking a Sunday night each with the commandments, some Sunday nights. We've gone two Sunday nights dealing with one commandment. This one will continue with next Sunday night. Honesty in dealing with the property of others. The bare text, the command, Exodus 20:15, you shall not steal. It's reiterated in the New Testament. Ephesians 4, 22 to 28, how you've been taught, dot, 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 to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one speak, each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, we're members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. And let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with everyone in need. The list that Paul deals with, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, has in the middle the kinds of unrighteousness that will not inherit the kingdom of God. And there's quite a long list. And in the middle, there's that phrase in verse 10, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then the work of Christ, such were some of you, but you've been washed and sanctified and, and transformed. I'm jumping right into the first point. The commandment about stealing was one of the first points of behavior that Paul applied to new Christians in the church. Now that alone is strange and ought to arrest our attention. He didn't feel it was some archaic bit of legalism uh, that had no application to New Testament believers. There are these two kingdoms, one of light, one of sin and darkness, and each one has its own style of operation. And in the kingdom of light, it's marked by this shall all men know you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And then there's the kingdom of darkness where Satan rules. And it's interesting, John 10.10, 10, the way he's described. Jesus describes Satan this way. John 10.10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of light. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And I don't know how many times I've read those verses, you as well, without noticing as strikingly as I should that Satan is described as a thief. The thief comes, he steals, he kills, he destroys. But he's not called a killer who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, or a destroyer who comes what he is is a thief. The thief comes. The thief comes. That's, that's his name. That's what marks him. To steal, kill, and destroy. So Satan is a thief. You and I are most like him and least like God when we steal or cheat someone out of what is rightfully theirs. That's what marks Satan. He's a thief. Okay, so Paul writes now these instructions to new Christians. That's the passage I read from Ephesians 4. And if you read the verses in their context, they would, they would go like this. Ephesians 4, 22 to 28. They've been taught to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires. That means we always justify the things that we do that aren't righteous. We don't, we, don't, we don't discuss them, we don't analyze them as being unrighteous. We twist things around and say, in our case, there are different circumstances. They aren't as bad as, as what some people might think. Deceitful desires were to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. That's the way we think, verse 23. We're to put on a new self. Notice, we put on the new self. The commandment is to us to put on the new self. It's not something that Christ does for us, it's something we're to do. 
put on the new self, 24, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness, and then, put away falsehood, 26, don't be angry, 28, don't steal. Those are the three things, those are the three things that Paul says have to be deleted from any life instantly upon coming to Jesus. Lying, 25. Anger, 26. Stealing, 28. Let me just talk about this, even if we don't finish. Because I am constantly amazed at how different Paul's approach is to the Christian life from much of the contemporary church. Paul does something that we hate doing. Paul uses lists. Have you ever noticed that? Read First and Second Corinthians. Read Ephesians. Read Colossians. Read Thessalonians. Pick any letter you want. Paul just is absolutely unashamed to make a list and say, here are the bad things you can't do anymore. We never approach the Christian life like that. We call that legalism. Old-fashioned. That's the way your grandparents lived the Christian life. We hate lists. We've been duped into thinking that somehow that's not a good approach to spirituality. We're a little more tolerant sounding, we're a little more gracious than what Paul has to say. I sometimes just picture some new uh, emergent convert coming to the Apostle Paul and he says, Paul, I just, I just came to Jesus and I love Jesus so much and I want to live every moment in his presence. I want to feel his presence moving in my heart. I just want to know him so much. I just want to praise him. I want to love him. Uh, how can I move into that special inner place? How can I just turn my whole life into an instrument of worship? I want to feel his embrace, you know, like those worship courses say. What's the secret? Paul. Okay, here's what you need to do. Stop lying. Deal with your temper. And don't ever steal or cheat anybody. And then he says, get a job, work with your hands, so you can be generous with people you meet that have needs. Take care of them. Spend less on yourself so that you'll be able to have more for them. No, no, I know, Paul, but you, you don't understand. I, I really want to go deep with Jesus. Like, I write poems when I'm in the shower. I, I want to learn to interpret dreams for all my friends. I really want the deep stuff. Like, like how do I get really at the deep place in my Christian walk? Okay, um, Paul, stop lying. Work real hard. Don't steal. Give to those in need. Deal with your temper. Why does, why does Paul start out with this kind of instruction? Because, because whatever else the Christian life is and whatever else it may become in time, Paul wants people like me and like you to understand that it always starts with, it's not all there is to it, but it always starts with and is never less than a total turning away from the patterns of the enemy, the thief, and his kingdom. You... you Put on, put on the new man, the new life. And it isn't just a mystical life, it's a real life, it's a pure life. It transforms whatever it touches, takes away the persistence of sin, gives holiness of character. That's what it does, that's what it does. Now some basic teaching, and we'll be done in just a minute. Point number two, some basic teaching on how the Holy Spirit, how does the Holy Spirit make bad people good? There's a, there's a certain kind of theology that is born in this Ephesians 4 text, 4, 22 to 28, and I know I just read them, but look at them again just for a minute. I think they're in your notes. You've been taught, dot, 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 to put off your old self, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he goes on. Therefore, 
having put away falsehood, let each one speak the truth with his neighbor, for we're members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sin go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And then, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now, here's my question. Why doesn't Paul say, put off your old self, belongs to the former manner of life, put on the new self? How do I do it, Paul? Why doesn't he say, well, he says, it's the things he leaves out. He doesn't say anything about prayer. Have you noticed that? We read right through those verses. Not a word about going to church. We know that's important. He doesn't say anything about Bible study. In all those instructions about holiness, he doesn't mention them. He, he makes it sound almost mechanical, doesn't he? Now certainly Paul knows about the reality and the necessity of the Holy Spirit's power in the believer's life. He teaches on it. I give you examples in the notes. Romans 8, 2. The law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Uh, Romans 8, 9, and 11. Galatians 5, 16. Walk in the Spirit. You will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So, okay, no doubt about it. Paul knows... Paul knows that it's more than just morality. He knows the Holy Spirit has to be involved. He knows we can't clean up our own lives all by ourselves. Paul believes in the power of the Spirit. He taught about the power of the Spirit. But the real question Paul is addressing in Ephesians 4 is, so how does the power of the Spirit get traction under the weight of my daily life? How does it start working in my daily life? How does this process, we call it sanctification, becoming holy, how does that start? What triggers it? What gets it all going? And the whole New Testament will say the same thing at this point. What triggers the power of the Holy Spirit in the purifying of a life is that person's decision to to repent of and renounce sin. That's why the first thing Paul says is you put off the old life. This is what you've been taught. Put off the old life. Not God puts off the old life for you. You put off the old life. I can already imagine objections. Well, no, Pastor Don. The believer doesn't have the power to clean up his own life. No, Pastor Don. The Bible doesn't teach a works kind of righteousness where we pull up our own socks and sort of fix up our lives. And I know that. I agree with that. But, but the Bible does teach that nothing of a life of holiness will be developed by the Holy Spirit until I'm absolutely resolute in calling sin, sin, and dealing with it in my heart. There's, there's a step you have to take. You can't clean up your own life, but you do have to bring that old life and say, I hate this. This is contrary to the kingdom of God. And you call anger what it is, a sin. And you call lying what it is, a sin. And you call stealing or cheating others. You call it what it is, a sin. You bring that and you say, I, I will not continue in this any longer. Jesus, help me. And, and there are hundreds of Christians who don't know that nothing of the power of the Holy Spirit will be released in the heart and life until a person comes to the place where they deal honestly with their heart and make the decision to repent and forsake of sin as sin before, before God. You can't change your life. You can clean up certain things. You know, you're smoking, and you can quit smoking. In fact, atheists can do that. But that's not the same as cleaning up the inside of the life. Jesus, picture a tree, and we'll, we'll wrap up with this. Picture a tree growing here. It's not in your notes anywhere. You can probably put the notes away. Jesus talked about a tree. And he said... You can read this. He said, 
You can't make a tree good by hanging good fruit on the branches. I'm paraphrasing, but that's what he said. So I've, I've got, a, I've got a, a dead, scruffy shrub, say, in my, in my garden. Now, you can go out there, I suppose, you can get tangerines, buy them at Costco, stick little hooks in them, and you could go out and hang tangerines all over that dead, twiggy shrub. But have you turned it into an orange bush? An orange tree? No. You, you, can't, you can't change the tree just by hanging fruit on it. Jesus said, but, but you can get good fruit, make the tree good. Remember when he said that? He said it to the Pharisees. Make the tree good. The fruit will be good also. And this is what, this is what Christ does. He comes and works in the heart. And what he does is he brings about pray. Pray for people you know. Pray for your own heart. Pray for the body of Christ. Pray that people come to have open eyes to see the sinfulness of their own sin. When they call upon Jesus to save, to cleanse, what he does is he comes and he cleans up the life. He makes the tree good. And then you get fruit that isn't just... Anybody can, can hang a few good habits on life. What Jesus wants is a life that is pure from, from the inside out. When is a thief not a thief? When he quits stealing? No. When he works with his hands, right? Works with his hands that he has something to give to people in need. Do you see how the heart is changed from a, a taker, that's what stealing is, to a generous, giving person? That's the kind of change Christ comes and makes in the heart. There's so many ways to apply. I didn't do it all tonight. That, that, that verse about, about stealing. And that's why uh, Paul uses the word a swindler. It's, it's a person who... How do, you, how do you do your income tax? It's a person who works for someone and makes sure they get a full day's work for their pay. It's a person who pays someone and makes sure they're paid for a full day's work. It's, it's, it's the way you don't rob someone's reputation by the things you say behind their backs to other people. Please, I'd rather have you take my wallet than take my reputation by things you say. So all of that, Christ changes and transforms from the inside out, which is a world different. Look for specific ways where the grace of Christ is changing your character and shaping your life. And when you kneel and pray, make that, make that something at the top of your list. God, not just what you're doing for me, but God, what are you doing in me? And everyone said...